Happy to see you all here. We have uh, some people back. Josh back with EKU, and Gabby's here. Uh, we met Gabby in Brazil when we were down there, so it's awesome. Um, just a few, just real quick announcement before we get started here. Uh, September 1st at 6.30, we're going to be having our Pursuit Night of Worship. If you guys haven't seen the flyer for that uh, on Sunday mornings when you've been here, then you've been not been paying attention to announcements. Crickets. No. Um, there it is. I know it's going to pop up at some point. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> so if you'll look behind me here, we've got the flyer for the Night of Worship. Um, and this is going to be a great time. We've had quite a few of these now, and they've always been amazing. So come out at 6.30, get you some coffee. We've usually got two pots of coffee just available. You don't have to pay for it. You just come and get it, enjoy yourself, or there's going to be a barista there who will make you a coffee drink if you'd like. Um, and then around 7.30, we're going to start worship, and it's just going to be a great time. So how many of you all have been to a night of worship with Pretty's, at Pretty's so far? How many of you all enjoyed it? Oh, Morgan. Jeez. Yeah, Lauren's going to put both hands up over here and then come back there and fight you with them. Um <laughs> Listen, when we, when we announced that we were going to do it at, at Purdy's, Lauren just, she lost it. She could not wait to get back there. Oh, all right, well, enough of that. I, I, have a, I have nothing else left to say with that. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to continue with what we've been talking about this month, which has been trials and tribulations in the Christian life. And how do we respond to trials and tribulations? What, what do we understand about them scripturally? How do we endure them? Where do they come from? All these different things. So we're going to continue with that tonight. And I want to touch on um, a couple of places in scripture that I think sometimes cause Christians to become really, um, I'm going to say, unsure about trials and tribulations. So we're going we're gonna to dive into those tonight and, and just examine them and what they say and versus maybe what we've been taught that they mean. It's different things. So if you'll just pray with me for a moment here before we get started. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to come together. And I pray that your presence would just minister to each and every one of us tonight. God, as I bring this word, I pray that you would just speak into my heart the things that you would like to say and what you want to speak to me individually as well as out into this wonderful group of people. And I pray that your name, Jesus, would be glorified in this place tonight, that people will walk away with a clearer understanding of who you are uh, in the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the Scripture as they open it up, that they would see you with fresh eyes, that they would hear your voice with fresh ears, and God, that they would go out this week and experience your power in the kingdom. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So just to summarize what I talked about last time, I, I took this word for tribulation in the New Testament, and I, 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 I made basically six points about these. this summarizes all the instances when this is used. I'm just going to read through those real quick before we start this next sermon here. So, tribulation in the Christian life in the New Testament. Number one, we're promised these difficulties, hardships, persecution, and distress in this world due to the fact that we're joined to Christ we're working for Christ, and simply because we're a part of a fallen world. This is promised to you. So whether or not you know Jesus, you're in a world that's fallen, that does evil things, and you will experience those evil things at times. How many have ever experienced evil in their life? Yeah, people have. Everybody in this room has been touched by evil in some way, shape, or form. That doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. But you have Christ to endure those things with. But he also told us, you'll be persecuted. There'll be distress. There'll be hardships. These things will happen because the word is in you, because you're joined to me. So this is promised. I want you to be encouraged. We're going to get there, so just hang with me. <laughs> Number two is there, hardships, difficulties, tribulations will be a consistent part of our reality until the coming of Christ and our entering into the age to come, at which point we are promised joy beyond understanding. Number three, we are to embrace these, rejoice in the midst of them, and be prayerful because we understand they are producing endurance and patience in us and are preparing us to carry the eternal glory. Number four, these will teach us to rely on God and His enablement instead of our own strength. Number five, God is greater than any of these tribulations, trials, hardships that we could endure. He comforts us in them and is in the, in the process cultivates compassion and empathy in us so that we may comfort others 
who go through hardships. And number six, they cannot separate us from Him. Under no circumstances can the tribulations of this world separate us from His presence. So although we are promised hardship and trials and tribulations at times, and you may be saying, hey, listen, I've, I've endured some of those things, and I'm in a season right now where things are actually going pretty well. Fantastic. I'm not going to sit here and say, well, look up, buddy, because one's coming. I, have, have you guys ever heard people say that before? They're like, you're either, you're either coming out of a difficulty, you're in a difficulty, or you're going into one, or, you know, or, or however it goes. And I'm like, oh, that's so encouraging. And, <laughs> and I don't think that way. I don't live my life expecting, Matt, that hardships are just going to keep coming. That I'm just, I'm a, I'm a glutton for punishment. They're just going to beat me down. But when hardships, trials, tribulations, distress of those sorts come, I don't let it shake me or take me off my firm foundation in Jesus. Because I know that the Scripture tells me these are going to come. But I can trust in Him. And I can go to Him. And I can rely on Him. And when I do, I find that grace meets me in that place to encourage me, to build me up, and to help me continue to put one foot in front of the other and go forward. So, I want you to be encouraged because when you endure trials, when you endure tribulations, when you endure hardships, you have a Savior who understands everything about it. And He's going to be right there with you. He just wants us to turn to Him. Now, some people don't like to talk about trials and tribulations and things like that because they're like, listen, don't, don't confess that. Don't, don't say that because then it'll come. It's like, that, we're not, I'm not superstitious. I'm a little stitious, not superstitious. But no. Um, some people got that. But, <laughs> I mean, but that's not what I'm saying here. If you, if you live as a human being on this earth, you'll experience something. The, the degree of how hard or difficult or tribulation that is is subjective to all of us. Matt, what you may go through could be just an absolute crisis for me, but when you go through it, it's not because of things that you've dealt with and things that you've been through in your life. I, I don't know. It's, it's just it's a subjective thing. But it doesn't change the fact that they will happen, they will come. So when they come, what's going to be our posture? What's going to be the posture of our heart and how are we going to walk through those things? Because that's important. I, I shared this quote last time um, when Samantha was working at LEF up in Lexington. There was a guy who came in there and climbed all the time, and, and she, you know, it, was just, it was a really, really difficult situation at the, at the time that um, he came up and was talking to her. And he, he asked her, he said, are you going through it or are you growing through it? And I, I, I've never forgotten that quote. I love that quote. I love that, that, that statement, that question. And that's what I think about when I think of the Christian life. I can go through it and just, Sophia, just get through it. Just as hard, just as quick as I possibly can and just be like, I want nothing to do with that. Or in the midst of it, I can take a step back and say, okay, the scripture tells me that when trials and tribulations come, they're an opportunity for me to grow in patience, for me to grow in endurance, for, for the rough edges to be sanded down in my soul, so to speak. Now, that doesn't mean I welcome all them every single day. Just keep bringing them. Just pour them on. No. But when they come, am I going to grow through the process? Now, have you, have you guys ever seen someone who can endure really well? It's like they can be like just carrying it all and you'd never know it. But when they talk to you about it, they, they'll, they'll, they'll open up and they'll share. But it's like it doesn't, it doesn't phase like their, their being. It doesn't phase their belief and their trust in God. It doesn't phase their daily life. They, they, it's there, and they're going through it, but they're not going to let it move them because they're rooted, they're firm on Him. And then there's other people who it's just like, man, the moment that a trial happens, it's just like, ah, the world is falling apart. You know, and you're like, well, what's going on? And then they tell you, and you're like, oh, oh, okay, all right. Well, how, how can I help you? What can I do? How can I, how can I come alongside you? And sometimes you find that people don't want help. They don't want to be comforted. They don't want the situation to be fixed. They just want to complain about it. And those are the kinds of people who, who just kind of stay in that place. And it's always a crisis and it's always a problem and nothing ever gets better. Okay, We're not called to be people who are complaining and who are just 
like it's the end of the world crisis every time every time something happens like Jesus tells us don't be anxious don't don't grow weary in well doing well if the things that are coming against me Daniel cause me to start becoming less and less effective in the kingdom then I'm growing weary in doing good I'm letting those things change me and that's I need to go back to him and say God this is hard this is difficult but I need your grace to continue through this and I don't want to complain and I don't want to I don't want to be, you know, just bring everybody down with my situation every single time. There's, there's one thing people say, well, I'm not complaining, I'm venting. It's like, those are the same thing, okay? And it's like, okay, well, hey, can I just talk to you about this? I need some prayer. And it, turns into, you know, it can turn into a complaining session. I'm not, I'm not saying don't ask people for prayer. I'm just saying understand that when things happen, be sincere in what you're doing. If something's going on in your life and you sit down with someone and say, I need prayer, then then tell them, hey, this is what's happening. I need you to come alongside me and help me in this. But let's not become people who, who quit being effective, who start being complainers, who sit down on our worship and our praise, who quit being helpful in the body of Christ and coming alongside with people just because trials and tribulations come. The point of all I'm saying is don't let trials and tribulations make you ineffective in your work in the kingdom. Because if that's the case, we'll never get anything done. Because they're going to be there. They're going to happen. I don't know when they're going to happen, but they're going to happen. So tonight, let's, let's talk about this a little bit, about having a mindset shift in the way that we see trials and tribulations. So there are ideas behind trials and tribulations that can hinder our walk with God. And, and sometimes it actually causes us to actually begin to look at God and consider Him the source of the problem. For some people, the moment something happens, they say, man, God's just putting me through it. And I'm like... Okay, okay. Sometimes you talk to people and they're like, hey, listen, I'm going through something right now. And as it continues to wear, you know, it continues to go and continues to go, they become weary and they begin to question, is, is, is God doing this? Like, this isn't letting up, Matt. Like, is God, is God doing this? Is God putting, the, is he putting the screws to me here? Like trying to, you know, trying to teach me something? And, and I had, I, I think I shared this last time that, I, I talked about this, was at the church I grew up in, a lady stood up and she, you know, she talked about carrying this sickness. And instead of going up and being prayed for for healing and, and pursuing God for healing, contending for healing, receiving it, she, she confessed in front of the congregation that this sickness was just going to be her cross to bear. And that this was just God teaching her something. And I was like, ah! I mean, you know how I feel about healing. I don't know if you don't know how I feel about healing, we can talk about it after the service. I really like healing in the body of Christ. To hear someone say that, I'm just like, ah! Oh, makes me want to just like chew my finger off, you know, when I, when I hear that. But, but you, may, you may hear me say that and say, well, no, but, but God uses those things to teach us. He uses those things. He uses trials and tribulations to perfect us. The Scripture says it, and I don't disagree with that. But attributing God as the source of the problem is a different thing than saying God uses it to my good. Those are two totally different things. Do you understand that? And that's what we want to divide here tonight. Because there's Christians who go through trials and tribulations and they get caught in the middle of the thing and then they say, God did this to me. I have no right to judge His character that way because something's going bad in my life. I do have the responsibility to get in this Word and actually look what it says and actually look and see what Jesus promised me and who Jesus says He is in His character. Then I can look at a trial, I can look at a situation and say, God, I know that you didn't cause this, and I know that you're with me in it. So many times as we encounter trials, whether it be sickness, ruin, financial ruin, even death at times, people will say, well, this was just God. God's in control, so God meant for this to happen. I, I want to say that I don't believe that's any, that's, that, that there could be anything further from the truth. And, and, I, and I'm very, very, I feel very certain about that. Because Jesus came to give life and give life abundantly. I trust Him with everything. Sometimes I've, I've prayed, I've prayed many times. And what I've prayed didn't happen, Matt. But it didn't make me trust Him any less. There's been times I've prayed for people and been in the room and knowing somebody was on their deathbed and just praying and praying and praying. And without ever getting a text message, without ever talking to anybody, I knew in my soul the Holy Spirit was saying, this person's with me now. It's, a, it's, it's done. 
and I struggled with that at times. I don't have the answer to, to why things happen, but that doesn't mean I attribute every problem that happens in life to God and say God is bringing evil on me to teach me a lesson or to try to fix something in me. Or if I, you hear people say, have you guys ever heard this before? Like, if you don't pay your tithes, God will get his money somehow. You guys ever heard that one? Oh, that's a really bad one. If you, if you don't, if you don't, not faithful in service, you know, my, God may take your health if you're not going to use it to worship him. Because people have said these things. People have taught these things from the pulpit. And they've maligned the, the, the view of God. And then we have a group of people who are growing up not knowing who he actually is. And they think they're, they're attributing things to God that Satan is doing. This is a problem. We have to know what the scripture says and we have to know who God is. So we can, we can become weary in those trials and then the enemy begins to get in our mind and he begins to try to convince us that, well, I'm, you've been really strong about this. You've got a real strong belief in God about this, but maybe you're wrong. And those things creep in. And that's where we have to take every thought captive and hold it in light of truth and say, does this look like Jesus? Does this look like the voice of my Savior? Because if it doesn't, then it has no right to speak into my being or hold an opinion, hold any weight in me. Okay? Maybe we don't know. So I come to Matt and I say, Matt, I've been really struggling with something and I'm not sure about this and this is what I'm thinking. And I share it to Matt and the moment it comes out of my mouth, my mouth Matt just slaps me and says, dang, dang, a bit of that came out of your mouth was truth. Hush it up. No, Matt wouldn't do that. No, I hope he would be stern with me though if I was confessing a lie. He would, he would, yes. Yeah. Uh, so we need people who we can talk with, Michaela, who we can say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what I'm thinking about the situation. Am I seeing this correctly? Am I seeing this clearly, Sophia? Am I, is this God? Is it, like, what's happening here? And we have this community of people who are getting in the Scripture who know God, who come around side, alongside us and say, no, no, this, like, let's keep our head on straight here. Let's not fall to pieces. Let's remember who He is and what He said He's going to do. And the, even better is if you've had prophetic words spoken in your life and you've shared those with friends and you, something's going on in your life and it's, contrary to that prophetic word having a friend come alongside you and say do you remember when you got that word and you're like i do you're like do you remember how that word is completely contrary to everything you just said and you're like yeah yeah i do thanks and it's like okay let's stop believing a lie let's start believing the truth you need friends like that who are going to come around side alongside you and help you my wife does that for me i'll come in sometimes and i'll, I'll start saying something she'll be like you remember that prophecy we got that time and i'm like yeah yeah, you remember how Joseph was in the dungeon? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. She'd be like, all right, dinner will be ready in a little bit. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> I'm like, thanks, hon, I appreciate it. So let's go look at a piece of scripture here. Hebrews 12, 4 through 7. This talks about where God disciplines those he loves. Okay, I'm going to read it for you here. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have completely forgotten, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship is discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Now, you may hear that and then listen to everything I just said and been like, well, there, it says it. It says it. God does these things. I have never killed someone because I was disciplining them. When I'm disciplining my children, I don't kill them. I don't know. Do I need to say anything else about this? Discipline from God is to move us forward into being made into the image of Christ. If His discipline kills me, then what redemptive quality is there in it? Informing me into the perfect image of Jesus. Okay? Death, in these cases, has no redemptive quality. <clears throat> now, God can do absolutely whatever He wants to do, but I find it inconsistent in His nature to kill those he's trying to discipline. I, I find it inconsistent. We're his children. I, I'm coming to him in faith, 
and coming to him in the middle of a trial, in the middle of a hardship, and said, listen, you know, you just ain't getting it. You're going to have to, gonna have to go, on, go on, the, on the old dusty trail here. And it's like, what redemptive quality is it whenever his punishment kills me or maligns my life? Does that make sense? Am I, am I being clear here? Not just death, but just any, think of any terrible, just egregious thing that has been attributed to God. And it's like, what, why, would he, why would I discipline my children that way? He's a better father than I could ever possibly be. He parents me better than I will ever parent my children. And there's never in a million years something I would do to my kids that would hurt them to try to make them good, to try to make them better. That's not what discipline is. Discipline is to propel me forward. Discipline is to form and perfect the image of Christ in me. <clears throat> so another area I want to look at is Acts 5. This is a good one. This one, this one I feel like trip, really trips people up. So, Ananias and Sapphira going to Acts 5. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? All right. Let's just read a little piece of this here. And I'm, I'm pointing out these sections of Scripture because these are the things I feel like the Holy Spirit pointed out to me and was like, these cause issues for people when they're going through trials and tribulations. These cause issues for the way people see my character and nature. So that's why we're diving into these particular ones. So Acts 5. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles feet but peter said and I asked, why has satan filled your heart to lie to the holy spirit and to keep back from yourself part of the proceeds of the land while it remained unsold did it not remain your own and after it was sold was it not at your disposal why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart you have not lied to man but to god and when Ananias heard these words he fell down dead and breathed his last and the great fear fell upon all who heard it. And the young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now, I'm not going to read the next part, but about three hours later, his wife, the same men carried her body out too. Because Peter said, hey, did you, did you sell that land? Your, your husband was by here earlier. He's, he's already gone. But did you sell that land for this much? Yeah, yeah, we did. All right. Have a good one. <laughs> Joe, Joe paraphrased. It's official Joe version. Um, I want to point something out about this. Because people look at this and say, we had two disciples in the community, Colton, who brought, who brought some stuff they in and they lied. And God killed them. God killed two people who were part of the community. Well, the Scripture doesn't say they were part of the community. There's, there's something here that I think the Holy Spirit very intentionally done through Luke when he wrote this. Thirteen times in the book of Acts, it says a certain man, a certain woman, a certain person. And every time it does that, it's referring to someone who is not a follower of Jesus. Every single time. Sometimes it's someone right before they become a follower of Jesus. And a certain woman who worshiped God then received the gospel and was baptized. But before she was a disciple, it did not refer to her as a disciple. Now, on the other hand, every time that it's referring to a disciple, it says a certain disciple, a certain disciple, and the disciples. This, this section of scripture starts out with, but a man, but a certain man, this man in the community. Ananias and Sapphira, I, don't, I do not believe that Scripture supports that they were followers of Jesus Christ. I believe they were people who were coming in and who were trying to deceive and lie and gain stance in the community and gain influence in the community. I, I believe that that's what was happening here. I think, that, I think that what is not said is what actually supports that. Now, I would encourage you to go study that. I, want, I, want to, I don't want you to just to take what I'm saying and be like, yep, yeah, that's right. Go study it for yourself. But I cannot find an instance in the Scripture where God kills one of His disciples. I can find situations in the Scripture where His disciples are killed and He receives them, Stephen being the first one I can think of here. And even when at Paul's conversion, 
God told that Ananias, not the same Ananias, different Ananias, that Ananias, he said, go and tell him, go and, go and lay hands on him that he may receive his sight, because I have much that I want to show him that he's going to suffer for my name. God told him, you're going to go through things. But we don't see in Scripture where God took one of his disciples, one of his children, Jacob, and said, that's the end for you. I'm going to make you pay the penalty and the judgment of your sin here. In this situation, I don't believe we're dealing with people who were disciples in the community. I believe we were dealing with people who were coming in in deception. In this, I believe the Scripture clearly testifies that they were full of deception. Now, has that, ever, has that section of Scripture ever caused an issue for you? Okay, Matt's back there like, absolutely not. Matt has no issue with that Scripture. Has anybody else ever had an issue with that Scripture before? I, I, I have. I, I have. I have really wrestled with that in trying to understand what the Scripture, like, what do I do with this Scripture? And I'm not trying to explain it away, but I'm just trying to simply point out what I see when I look at the book of Acts. And what I see when I look at the book of Acts is those who are numbered with the disciples are referred to as disciples, and those who aren't are not referred to as disciples. The next one I want to look at is in Acts chapter 12. This is a situation with Herod. I'm not going to read the, the section of Scripture here, but basically Herod gets killed here. And the Scripture clearly says an angel struck him and he died. I have no issue with this Scripture because these people were quite evil and Herod was not a follower of Jesus. I, I debate on whether I even bring this one up because it goes right along with the last point I made about the husband and wife in Acts 5. Just because Herod received judgment for what he was doing does not mean that God disciplines his children through trying to kill them and cause sickness to them and beat them down. And that's God's way of, of teaching us a lesson and helping us to become better. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? So, And the whole point of this is, what do trials and tribulations look like in the Scripture for the Christian? Colton, how do we go through those trials and tribulations? And what is the right mindset? So we're looking at these sections of Scripture to see, because these are areas of Scripture that I have found that hung me up and also that have hung up people I've had conversations with. So I don't believe that Scripture testifies that God disciplines His children in the ways at which we have said that He does. I think what God does is that God takes the trials and the things that happen in this world and he draws us very near to himself in the middle of those things. And he will use those situations to smooth the edges, to form us, to shape us, to mold us. I have went through some of the most difficult things I've went through, and on the other side of them, because of the experience that I had with God afterward, Kayla, I've looked back and said, I don't ever want to go through that again, but I wouldn't change it for anything. Because on the other side of it, I experienced him and I knew him more than I ever had before. He didn't cause it. I could look at every situation and say, he didn't cause this. He wasn't the root cause of this. Maybe it was my own bad decision or it was the actions of someone else. But he met me in the midst of it. And he walked with me through it. And he delivered me from it. And he transformed me in it. Trials and tribulations are a part of our life that God will walk with us through them. The last one um, you, can, you can look at, and I think this is one that, the, and this is another one I traditionally hear people mention sometimes, is Revelation 2, with the, the church where Jesus says, that woman Jezebel, who's, she calls herself a prophetess, he's, he's not referring to her as like one of my faithful followers here. He's like, there's this woman in your community who calls herself a prophetess, who's leading my people in sexual immorality and sin, and you guys are tolerating her, and I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to deal with her, but I'm going to deal with you if you don't stop tolerating it. This is what's going to happen. This is not someone, again, who's a follower of Jesus, who's faithfully serving Him and loving Him and rejoicing at the name. This is someone who has crept into the community. This is what the book of Jude is about, the letter of Jude about those who come in who are trying to deceive and to, to hold captive those who are in the community. 
Those people are not the followers of Jesus that we're talking about. Those are not the, the you and I that are here right now who are hearing this. It's the people who are coming in with ill intent in their heart and trying to, to deceive and gain power and notoriety and things like that. So the first point here was we need to have a mindset shift in how we see certain sections of Scripture that deal with God's actions. That's what we just covered. And I, and I hope maybe this has given you something to think, out, think about, but I hope maybe it has helped you to see a little more clearly who the source is of these things. And, and it's, easy, it's easy for some people to say, well, listen, I never had a problem with that. Like, I never believed that God did that. But then when they go read the section of Scripture, you're like, well, how do you explain this then? And they're like, well, I don't know. So I'm just going to breeze over it. I'm going to just not read Acts 5. We're going to go 4 and then 6, and it's really beautiful. We're not going to worry about 5. It's like, but 5 matters. There's important things in 5. We can't breeze over sections of Scripture just because we don't understand them, because you want me to tell you something real quick? That's going to be what the enemy uses to deceive you and confuse you later on. When you breeze over the things that you don't understand, and you willfully, willfully don't study them because they're hard, those are going to be the traps that the enemy puts you in. Don't be one of those people. Study the hard things. Wrestle with the hard things. But keep clear in your mind the character and nature of God while you're doing it. <clears throat> so what is the practical response of a Christian going through trials and tribulations then? I'm going through a difficult situation, Daniel. It's not been fun at all. I don't believe that God did it. But I'm in it. Here we are. <laughs> it's just like this a never-ending movie. What do we do? <laughs> Let's go to James 1, 2 through 4. See if I can beat Jonah. All right. Count it all joy. My he even put it in the ESV. You know me, man. You know me. That warms my heart. Thank you. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. When I encounter trials and tribulations, I don't allow what is happening around me to change the reality of Christ in me. I don't let it change my effectiveness in serving in the kingdom. But what I do is, <laughs> I resist the temptation that the world does, what, how the world responds, and I do that, I resist the way the world does it. Because when the world falls into trials and tribulations, it's just like chaos, crisis, we're just, this is, everything's falling apart, or I've got to blame somebody. Everything's falling apart, or I've got to blame somebody. When we go through trials and tribulations and, and issues, we don't let that change the reality of what we have in us, Kayla. We don't let that change the effectiveness that we do in the kingdom. There's been some times where I'm sure if you talk to Pastor Moody, I, I, can, I can say it for myself, there's been times where I've got up to preach, and when I've got up to preach, I've not really felt like preaching because things happened right before I got up to preach that were not conducive of a good preaching environment in my life. <laughs> Sometimes you get really bad news five minutes before you're supposed to start helping disciple someone. It's like, oh, I'm meeting so-and-so at Pretty's at 6 tonight or at, a, or at 5 this evening to have a conversation, and at 4.55 I get a phone call that just could completely derail my whole evening, but I can't let that change what God has given me this assignment to do. It doesn't make it any less real, but I don't let that change my effectiveness in working in the kingdom. So how do we respond to those things? Well, we respond to those things by choosing to exercise the fruit of the Spirit. This is, a real, this is great. Okay. All right. Are you joyful when you feel joyful? I think that's, yeah, I think you're joyful if you feel joyful. Can you be joyful even if you don't feel joyful? Yes, you can. I, I shared something with Jenna this week that um, Bill Johnson said, Sam sent it to me, and then I was like, this is really good, and I sent it to Jenna. I don't know, did you share it with Daniel? You should have shared it with Daniel. Ah, uh, okay, Daniel, she should share it with you. But he said, there's been times where I've been in difficult situations, and there's been such a weight over me, 
and I could not pray myself out from under it. I could not get out from under this thing. I couldn't fast enough to get out from under this thing. I couldn't do anything. But what happened was I chose to exercise joy in that moment, even though I didn't feel like it, and I found that almost instantly that thing would lift. Because I'm choosing to lean into a, re a, a, a reality of the Spirit that is available to me, even when I don't feel like it. And by making that decision, guess what happens? You find that joy comes. So do the, does the fruit of the Spirit grow in our life and then we have it? Or do we choose to walk in it and then we see it? It's, it's both and. As we grow in relationship with God, the fruit of the Spirit just naturally grows in our life. But every day I get to choose, am I going to be in the Spirit or am I going to be in the flesh, Kaylee? Am I going to walk in peace or am I going to walk in frustration? So when trials and tribulations come against us, I actually have the ability. I have a will that I get to choose to exercise. And I can choose to lean into life in the Spirit. And in that moment when that frustration comes, then I say, God, I'm, I'm going to lean into peace right now. I'm going to put my mind on you. Because Isaiah 26 and 3 says, you'll keep me in perfect peace if I keep my mind on you. So that's what I'm going to do right now. And in the middle of this really difficult situation, I'm going to receive your peace. I'll confess that. I'll confess that in the middle of the moment so that myself can hear it. <laughs> I can hear it. I'm going to choose to walk in peace right now. When you choose to exercise the things that are available to you in the Spirit, that are supposed to be fruit in your life, you find, thank you Jonah, you find that it's evident. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you because he trusts in you. So whenever chaos comes into my life, Morgan, and I feel it bearing down on me, man, it's coming. Woo! I go into that moment and I say, God, I'm putting my mind on you. I'm putting my heart on you. And right now I'm going to walk in peace in this. And I stay in that place. And I protect that. And there's been other times where I've, I've man, there, there was a, Sam and I were just talking about this the other day. I was at work one day, and I was like halfway through the day, and I just noticed that something just felt different. I was like, where did I lose my peace? I felt so peaceful coming into work today, and everything was going good in it. And now I don't feel the way I'd felt earlier. What is this? And I'm not talking about like a, a feeling, necessarily an emotion, but just the reality of my soul did not feel as though it had before. And I began to sit there and just recount my whole day. I went back like moment by moment, everything I could think of, until I hit it right on the head. A conversation. And in that moment, I let that conversation steal my peace. The peace was there, and then I partnered with something in that conversation that stole my peace. I believed something, I heard something in that conversation that stole my peace. And I had to go back to that and say, whoa, Holy Spirit, I need my peace back. God, I just, man, I, I just, I turn from that. I repent from that in my mind. I lay that back at your feet. That person was saying stuff, and I, didn't, I don't want that. I don't want to carry that. You know, maybe, maybe you hear some, some gossip, and when you hear that, you walk away from it, and now something feels different. Well, where'd your peace go? You left it right back there. But you can choose to repent and turn right back into it and lean back into it and receive what God has for you. So when we go through trials and tribulations, when we go through difficulties, we can choose to exercise the reality of the Spirit, is what I'm saying. That's not always easy, Jacob. Sometimes it, sometimes it takes some pressing in for me. Because whatever's going on in my life may be really pressing me in that moment. But for me, what I do is I start with just opening up my Scripture. And I begin to read. Sometimes I go to the Psalms and I just begin to read some of the Psalms. And I go to read some of my favorite passages. And before long, I find I've been reading for 20, 25 minutes and I don't feel what I felt when I first picked up my Bible. Sometimes I just turn on some music and I begin to worship. And I begin to feel the atmosphere changing in my life. Because I'm choosing to, to walk in a different reality. Because that's what's available to me. And that's actually what the Holy Spirit expects of me. He expects me to lean into Him and let Him do this thing in my life. Let Him be my peace. Let Him be my joy. So does that mean that we don't seek God to deliver us when stuff happens? Man, if, it, if it's good for us, then we shouldn't want to get out of it, right? Well, that would be crazy if I said that. Because no one has ever went through something and been like, God, just double it. Whew, wow. Man, just double it, Lord. It's like, absolutely not. 
my worst trials, I've been like, God, save me! You know, you're just in the altar, weeping, crying out. And then later on, you're like, wow, God, look at the work you did in my life through that. Oh, that was so good. You know, it's like three days before, though, I was like, get me out of this right now! You know. So let's look at 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. I'm going to beat him, I'm going to beat him, I'm going to beat him. Bam, I'm here. I'm here, Jonah. Just want to say it. <clears throat> no, I'm not. I'm on the right page. No, I'm not. Now I am. Okay. All right, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. This is the classic Paul's thorn in the flesh. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. So, it says... So to keep me from being from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses." insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul, the great Apostle Paul, when he went through these difficult situations, still pleaded and cried out for God to deliver him from it. <clears throat> so what I want to say here is that it's never... It's never wrong to ask God to deliver you from something. That's not the problem. When things happen, I go to God and I'm saying, God, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going on here, but I don't want to be a part of this. I'm just choosing not to participate. It's like, well, sorry, you're in it. It's like, okay. So I'm in it. I'm still going to pray and I'm still going to seek and I'm still going to invite people to come around me and to pray with me about it. But in the midst of it, I'm not going to let it change who I am and who Christ is in me and my effectiveness in the kingdom. But it is entirely biblical to pray and intercede when hell sets down on your life or the lives of those you love or the church or the community. Because we're in a war. Jesus, Jesus has conquered. Let me, let me say this. Jesus has conquered. But we are living in a world that still is subjected to to the powers of darkness until His final coming. We participate in that by not warring against flesh and blood, but by warring against the things of the Spirit with the weapons of warfare that we've been given. We've been given prayer. We've been given to partner with the Holy Spirit to receive His grace, to hear His voice and to proclaim truth in every matter. So when I go into a situation that's difficult, I'm not trying to convince God that it's bad and He needs to deliver me from that. It's like, God, listen, I understand. You may be doing a good work here, but this is really tough, and I think we just need to go ahead and wrap it up. Like, that's not what I'm doing here. But there's a real enemy. There's a real enemy out there who's doing very dark and evil things. I want, I'm, I'm not going to go down a rabbit trail with that. I'm going to stop right there. Just... Let's stop there to say that it is entirely biblical to intercede and to contend for deliverance for the things, the trials and tribulations. But even while we wait, patiently enduring, we don't let it change us from knowing who Jesus is or being effective at the work He's given us. Does that make sense? And if you look at Matthew, when Jesus is in the garden... I'm going to read this passage real quick, Matthew 26, 36 through 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Matthew and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for an hour? He asked Peter, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. 
And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus still contended for deliverance even in that moment. But in the midst of it, he understood. If this can't, then help me to, help me to receive it. Help me to endure it. Now, I'm not going to dive into what exactly he may have been praying about because that's up for debate depending on who you talk to. Because he knew the cross set before him and he knew there was, he said that there was joy for, because of what he was going to endure. The salvation, the, the restoring of all creation. But in this moment, what he was contending with, maybe it was the crucifixion, Jacob. Maybe it was the fact that his disciples were all about to fall away. Maybe it was about the hardship that they were about to endure. Maybe it was because of what was about to happen to, to Jerusalem in the next coming decades. There's lots of things that this could have been. It could have been all of those things. It could have been one of those things. But the, the point of what I want to get at here is that what Jesus did was he, when he was troubled and he was overcome in this trial and tribulation, he went to the Father. He went to the Father and pleaded, and he went back, and he went back. But the moment, that last time he stood up and he knew, and I, and I can imagine, because he said, here comes my betrayer, maybe, maybe he just knew, maybe he knew in that moment, they're here, or maybe he stood up and he saw, here they come. It's not my deliverance, it's my crucifixion coming down the road. And he knew in that moment, I'm not being delivered from this. I'm enduring this. We should never be afraid to go to God when we're going through trials and tribulations. We should never be afraid to pray for strength and deliverance because we need it. But let's not become people who attribute things to God that He never did. Let's not become people who question the character and nature of God because we don't understand a situation. Jesus said, I came to give life and give life abundantly. Do I trust that He's here to give life? If I do, then let that be guidance for me in every situation, Matt, that I understand that He is good. He's not just great, He's good. His character is good. And He will bring good through every situation. Matt, if you want to... Come on. And I don't have to be concerned about whether or not he knows about it, Jacob. I don't have to be concerned about whether or not he's concerned about it because I know that he is. Because I know that he draws near to me. <clears throat> so when you face trials and tribulations, when you face difficulties, don't let the enemy trick you into thinking that this is God. But also, don't be afraid to go to your friends and say, listen, I'm going through something and I need, I, I need help in this. And I need you to pray with me. I need you to fast with me. Do you remember whenever the, Jew, the Jewish population's existence was on the brink of destruction? And Esther says, I may die. Everyone, fast and pray. No food, no water. I'm going in. And God delivered the Jews that day. When we know the character and nature of God and we know what Jesus says about trials and tribulations and we know the heart of God, then we can confidently go through these things. And we can confidently pray in them. If I don't know if it's the will of God for me to be healed, then how am I going to pray confidently for healing? You know, you know how many people I saw healed when I first started praying for them when I was saying, God, if it's your will, just let them be healed? I saw zero people healed. Because in me, there was no faith. Because I didn't actually know if God wanted them to be healed or not. Because of things I may have grew up hearing or, or my, own, my own misunderstandings. But when I searched this scripture and I saw the truth in it, when I saw the truth that Jesus healed and delivered and set free, and it was His, his He came, you know, John, 1 John says, to destroy the works of the devil. 
that created a confidence in me because truth, truth came in and I saw clearly. And in that moment, I was like, well, I don't have to, Kayla, I don't have to be worried anymore when I go to pray for someone. I know that healing is God's will. Now, did that mean every single person I prayed for got healed? Absolutely not. Did I see more people get healed afterwards? Yes, absolutely. When I began to believe the truth, I began to see the fruit of truth. So when trials and tribulations come, how we go through them matters. We can go through them in a way that allows God to grow us and shape us and mold us. We don't have to go through things the way the world does. But we can also, Kelsey, go through it in a way that we come out on the other side not judging God's character, but being even nearer to Him than we ever were before. Because we understand He was walking with us through the whole thing. Now, you may have been through some difficult things in your life right now, and, and what you're hearing me say is that maybe, maybe that, that may be difficult to hear because you, you still don't understand why things happen. And I'm not going to stand here and say I know why things happened in your life the way they did. I have went to God with things and said, God, why is this happening? And His answer has been to me is, I'm not going to answer that question. But if you just draw near to me, I will take care of you. Sometimes we don't get the answer. And that, that can be very uncomfortable for us. But do we still trust Him? Do we still love Him? Do we still worship Him? Do we still walk with Him, even when we don't understand? Because I can look back at all those situations now and say, God, I, it would have been nice if you'd have gave me an answer, but I can rest comfortably in knowing that you didn't cause those things, but you did walk out of them with me. And you didn't leave me there. He is our hope. He's our salvation. He's our deliverance. He is everything. And when we experience the trials and tribulations of this world, He is right there with us. All we have to do is turn to Him. If you'll stand with me. Father, we just thank You for this time to come together. And we thank you for the work that Jesus did on this earth, the, the life that he modeled for us, but the life that he laid down for us. And I pray that if anyone in here is going through a difficult situation, that, that your spirit would be there in comfort and peace beyond what they could ever imagine as they lean into you. And before I go on, I, I, I want to say while your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, is if, if you don't know this God that I've been talking about, and you're going through difficult situations and you've never, you've never met Him, you've never walked with Him, you've never experienced His peace and His grace and His mercy and love, then you can right now. You can come up when we open the altar up and I'll meet you right here. And we'll pray together and I'll introduce you to the person who saved my life in more ways than I could possibly imagine. Who set me free and delivered me from dozens of issues. Who became my hope. But if you're here and you do know him and you just want to come pray, then the altar is going to be open. If you're going through a difficult situation and you want somebody to pray with you, then go grab someone and say, hey, Listen, I may not know you very well, but can you come with me? Can you pray with me? Can you come alongside me in this moment? But as we go into some more worship before we close tonight, I want to invite you up to pray. I want to invite you to come and lay down whatever you've been carrying, whatever's maybe been hindering between you and the Lord, lay it down. Whatever trial and tribulation you've been going through that you've been carrying the weight of, lay it down and to receive His peace and that newness of life fresh.